everyone, it's Dylan and my father from the Black Forest Wood Company, and we're back for part three, the final installment of our Salt Lake City series, and I think we've left the best for last. We're doing the desk today. Oh my gosh, that's a piece of work. There's a lot of components that are gonna to go together with that. Everything has to fit just perfectly. John and Jack have masterminded the whole construction of this. Our team, Ibrahim with the design, Dylan with working with the customers. You wait, you guys. So this desk is probably one of the most intricate projects we've done to date in our shop. Um, first of all, it featured this incredibly large slab of Bastone Walnut. And some of you longtime watchers on our channel might remember this tree from the Joe Manganello project. So Joe actually picked a slab from this same tree. It was a little bit larger, but he used it to create his custom Dungeons and Dragons table. And we'll put a link here if you guys want to go watch that. This client instead is going to turn one of these slabs into a desk. So. We're getting ready to start on this massive Bastone Walnut desk and what Ibrahim is doing right now is just capturing a photo of it uh, so that he can import that into his rendering software and actually do an accurate layout of this slab. So that's what's happening right now and then we'll go over to Ibrahim's computer screen and kind of show you that process. Now that Ibrahim has the rendering complete and we know exactly where we need to cut this slab, we can mark our lines out on it and begin using our saw to break down all these pieces. Part of what's so unique about these slabs is that they measure in at over nine feet wide at the widest point, which means that we don't have to add any extra pieces to yield this piece. We usually do this before we flatten the slab so that we can ensure we get maximum thickness out of all the individual components. Especially with this slab being eight feet wide and the widest point, if we were to just try and flatten this in one shot, number one, it wouldn't really fit on our CNC machine, but if it did, what would happen is you'd likely lose most of your thickness and you'd start off at this three inch thick slab and probably end up with something around an inch and a half. Whereas with us cutting off all of those wide sections of the slab, it's much easier for us to get the maximum thickness out of these pieces. And then once we have everything flattened on our CNC machine, we can get the slabs lifted upstairs and begin lifting them into the mold. Another reason that you can see it's important to get the slabs completely flat before we do the pour is so that they sit perfectly flat in the mold and that we don't get any resin that's gonna leak beneath those slabs. Something else you're gonna see here is that this mold is kind of strangely shaped. It's not really your typical rectangular mold. And that's because we are going to be waterfalling all the different sides of this desk. And of course, as always, we're using our Black Forest Deep Resin for this pour. And even though these slabs are almost three inches thick, we're able to do this without any issues of overheating or cracking. And then something else similar on this job to the Joe Manganello project is the resin color. Some of our clients have begun referring to this as the Manganello blue, and that's exactly what we're doing here. We're pouring it as a base layer, about half an inch thick, and we're gonna let this partially cure before we come along and pour our final top layer. And there's, there's a few ways you can go about doing these base layers. You can do what I just described and let it partially cure, or you can let the layer completely cure and then sand it before pouring your top layer. Both of them work completely fine, but you can get some really interesting effects created if you let the resin partially cure because it's still soft enough where the, the weight of that top clear layer will begin to deform that base layer and create these extra ripples in the resin. So you probably will be able to see this later in the video when we get some close-ups but it's a really, really unique effect that we've been offering on much more of our pieces. And then after seven days of curing in the mold, we can begin demolding this piece. Our mold construction is pretty simple. It consists of MDF that we've coated in tuck tape. And as you can see, that pops off quite easily once the resin's cured. And then we also have a bead of silicone that goes around the inside and outside of the mold just kind of as an insurance policy so we don't get any leaks. And then given the size of this piece, it's extremely heavy, so we've got just about all hands on deck to get this thing safely moved around. And now it's time to get it back onto the CNC machine to flatten this massive pour. And here's a great shot of that T-shape I was mentioning. So the side of the desk closest to the forklift is going to be the top surface. And then the two T's, or the narrow parts of the T, are gonna fold down to be the ends and then that other part that shuts out is gonna be the back, if that made any sense at all. And here we're taking that excess layer of resin off the top of the piece from a resin pour. 
We do get asked quite often on why we do that extra layer of resin, and it's simply because it allows us to fill in all the cracks and voids in a single shot. Uh, for us, being a large production facility, labor is one of our most expensive costs. So if we're able to cut down the time we need to spend doing fills by spending a little bit more on epoxy, it ends up being more cost effective for us in the end. So as you can see, we've cut one of those large sections off our resin pour blank, and now we're sending it through our thickness sander. Something important I want to mention here as a little tangent is that we're going to be getting a brand new thickness sander in a couple months coming from SCM. It's a 54 inch wide helical planar sander. So the first head is the helical planar head, then it has two sanding drums and then a sanding platen. And it's just something we're really excited to have showing up here in our shop soon. And then from there, it's over to the SCM panel saw. As you guys can see, we love SCM. We've had this saw for about 20 years. And now we're beginning to cut these blanks down to their size so that we can cut the 45 degree angles on them. So before we go ahead and cut those 45 degree angles, we do get them cut to that, that rough size essentially that they need to be. So here you can see the boys are cutting off one of the legs from the top component. And then once we have our four components, the top, the back, and the two legs, we can then set the saw to the 45 degree angle to make those final cuts for the waterfall joinery. And to secure that joint, we're using our Festool Domino to add some tenons in there. This helps with alignment, but on a 45 degree joint like this, it does help with strength as well. If you were just doing a, a 90 degree edge joint, the dominoes really only help with alignment. They don't do much for strength, but being that this is the 45, it makes a difference here. And as you can see, we're putting wood glue, specifically Type Bond 3, over the wooden sections of this lamination, and then our coat thin epoxy over the epoxy sections. And that's primarily for aesthetics, because if you were to put wood glue over the whole section of this, and we have that clear resin, obviously that would not look very good in the finished product. So firstly, what we did was glue the back on, and we had to actually let this piece cure in place before we could put our sides on, because it was going to act as kind of a, a jig or a, a straight edge for us to line up these sides. So we did our first test fit and then it's the same exact process for the side lamination where we're doing tight bond three on the wood and then our coat thin on the epoxy sections. And for a lamination like this, because it does involve epoxy, typically we're leaving it in the clamps a little bit longer than usual. So something with just wood glue, we might take out the next day, but this we're leaving for usually two or three days, just so we can be sure everything's perfectly cured. One of the most labor intensive parts of the process is sanding up this entire piece. Now, something my dad always says that's kind of funny, is if you don't like sanding, you're probably not gonna like woodworking because it consists of about 50% of woodworking is just sitting there with your sander. So you kind of have to get comfortable and in love with this monotony that, that sanding is. But to prep these pieces, uh, we take them up to 320 grit using our Merca sanders. And we're also being sure to clean out any of that extra epoxy that's left in the corners from the lamination. And something we began to realize at this point, which we knew was gonna happen, this piece is getting very awkward because of the weight and shape of it. It's no longer got that big footprint that it did from the resin pour, so we can't get as many bodies around the outside of it. And it's just, it's not that easy to move around. And now we can begin working on all the cabinetry that's gonna sit beneath this desk. So something that we did here for a detail on this that I really appreciate is we matched all the exposed panels in Bastone Walnut to go with the slab that's used in the top resin pour. And they are coming from the exact slab used in that pour. Some of the interior components on the cabinet that you're gonna see that aren't visible from the outside, we did use Canadian Black Walnut because we didn't quite have enough of the Bastone Walnut from this single slab to yield those components. But in the end, it all goes together very beautifully as you'll see. And here Jack's using the biscuit joiner to glue up some of the components for the interior parts of the desk. And again, kind of similar to the domino, this is purely for alignment. It doesn't do anything to add strength to this lamination. We just want to ensure that after the glue up, we're going to get our maximum thickness out of these panels because even though you don't need the, the biscuits for strength, what can happen is if you do a glue up without them and you're even out by a millimeter or two millimeters on either side, that can result in you losing thickness on your components and then ultimately having to rebuild new ones if it doesn't work with your design. And then it's back through the thickness sander and from there we'll move on to our dovetails.
Another nice feature that we like to add on all of our drawer components are dovetail joinery. We do have a dovetailer that allows us to do this, but don't hate on us. We are capable of doing hand cut dovetails. Actually, that being said, Jack, I believe, won the regionals for the skills competition. Uh, that's like a it's basically a woodworking trades competition here in Alberta, and that's Jack right there. So he's very good at hand cut dovetails. It's just in our shop, and, and because of the amount of components we have, we use the dovetailer. Once we have all the dovetails cut, then it's over to the saw stop to put a little dado groove in the bottom just to accept the bottoms of these drawers. And once all the joinery is cut on these drawer boxes, then it's time to go ahead with the glue up. And same as the wooden components for the desktop, again here we're using Type Bond 3. Now, something I want to mention that we've kind of switched to recently that we maybe should have known before is in our drawer boxes for the bottoms, we used to do solid which you can do, but we notice that you kind of get quite a bit of expansion and contraction, obviously. And in order to combat that, you have to leave them quite loose, which then causes kind of this rattly drawer construction. So we have switched to a plywood and veneer construction for our drawer bottoms. Don't worry, that's as much plywood and veneer as you're probably ever gonna see us use in our shop. We're sticking to solid. We just wanna make sure that for the longevity and proper function of these drawers, we're using the plywood construction. And then once we've got all the drawer boxes glued up, it's back over to the saw stop to cut them to our final size. So we just make four cuts here, right? We spin it around and cut each edge until we get it down to its final size. And then once our drawers are cut to their proper sizes, we can begin to install the hardware that's going in here. So we like to use Bloom. We've used that for a number of years now. Uh, we're, we're not sponsored by them, although we would really like to be Bloom if you're listening. Uh, we just think they make really great hardware. And what John's doing here now is drilling out the threaded inserts that are gonna go into the desk itself because that's how we're gonna attach these cabinets that are gonna go beneath the desk. We're not gonna glue any of these cabinets in primarily because this desk is already heavy enough as is and it would be nearly impossible to move if we glued or permanently fastened anything in. And it's also gonna make it a lot easier for the shipping and setup process when we take this down to our client's house in Salt Lake City. So we get those boxes attached with threaded inserts, which are from Rampa, and we do sell those on our website if you guys wanna check those out. And then John's just lifting the drawer boxes in. And then if you remember from the rendering, not only does this piece have the resin and bath stone walnut on the top, back, and sides, it also has it on the front side of the desk where there's two giant doors and a drawer. So what you're seeing us do right now is thickness those on our sander, cut them to size on our panel saw, and from there we can begin installing the hardware. On all of our cabinets, we like to use Tectus hinges. Again, not sponsored, but we would like to be. Primarily because of their high capacity, we can put these big heavy doors that we're used to constructing on these hinges without having to worry about overloading them. But number two, something else really nice about them is they have a lot of adjustability. So in the case that any of these doors move, we can give our clients advice on how to adjust these hinges and have the door still function perfectly. And you know, in all transparency, it is something that can happen. We're kind of taking a risk here by using these big solid wood pieces for doors like this, and it, it may break a lot of the traditional rules. Uh, but fortunately, with this style of construction, we've had very good luck so far. And then when it comes to hardware on the top of this desk, the client went with a really minimal approach, which I think was the right decision. He decided just to have one wire grommet in the back right corner, and it's a little metal insert that's just gonna allow his cables to come up for his computer, and I think that's about all he needs on this desk anyways. Another standard detail we like to add to all of our pieces is a two millimeter, 45 degree bevel on the outside, just enough to soften the edge, but not so much that it creates something that becomes a feature on its own. We still wanna maintain those really sharp lines, um, but not create something that's gonna be awkward to sit at. And then it's off to our finishers to apply the two component acrylic urethane to this desk. This client did want something that was going to have maximum durability and that he wasn't going to ever have to worry about doing any maintenance on. And given that this isn't going in any kind of commercial setting where it's expected that it's gonna get crazy damage and he's just gonna be personally using this as his home office desk, the acrylic urethane is the perfect way to go. Okay, so this is a very custom desk. This client had a lot of very specific requests that he wanted here. He's got a slide out tray for his printer and there needs to be an outlet right at the back of this tray, but then that would create a problem in that if he slides this out, it's gonna unplug the cable from his printer. So we have a sponsor for that. 
Docking Drawer has sponsored this video and they've supplied us with this really unique cable management system for an extending outlet. So it's on this hinged arm. Jack is going to install this into that hole. And then there's a little hole at the back of this tray where the head of our cord can slide through and it's just gonna make for some nice organized cable management for this client. So thank you to Docking Drawer for sponsoring this week's video. And we'll leave a link in the description where you guys can go pick one of these up for yourself. And now we can begin packing up all of our components and get ready for this delivery down to Salt Lake City, which is something I think we were all really excited for because none of us had ever been down to that part of the United States. Uh, so it was kind of like a little bit of a vacation for us in a way. Okay, well, we're here this morning at Salt Lake City, Utah, and we're gonna install this incredible package that we brought down here for them. Beautiful day. Right. Room. Is it heavy? No. The desk room, where is that? With all the, the mounts. So good. All right, all right, here we go. Two, three, lift. Hey, let me get under it. Hang on. We got plastic here. Flush it. Yep. Okay, all right. You guys yeah. good? Yeah, we're good. Straight out. Right you're gonna fall yeah, off a little like cliff. Yeah. Yeah, there's a step coming up. Hey, Ram, coming yeah. up. We gotta clean it. Metal, hot dogs. Right. There we go. They can only get. Yeah. Okay, one at a time. There's there. We get on this end. Let's keep going. Oh. Oh. You got it, bud. Yeah. Good. Ready? Wait, yeah, you guys swing into the wall and hang yeah, down. Yeah, you want it on a bit of an angle. Right here. Right, from here we're good. We'll fly it, so press it down. Okay. Everybody's fingers out. Yeah. All right. Tip it down nice and slow. Yeah, right. All right. Oh, oh, good job. <laughs> your friends took yeah. your trucks? Yeah. Well, I gave them the trucks. Shimmying the mids. Uh, maybe there, maybe there. Oh, uh, we can do it. It's just to get us to line up oh, okay. right where we need it. Okay. Set it down there. Sweet. You can get it bolted in from there. It all lines up, so. And he's not a... I will do that right away. Let me get this one in place. Hinges. They're on the doors. Oh, they're on the doors. Yep. Cool. Didn't feel like oh. taking them off and putting them back on again. Just wrapped it up really well and they were good. Yeah. You're not in on this side, I don't think. Yeah, I'm on. Maybe you are. Sorry. I can feel it, Mr. Krabs. Sorry, just. I was expecting unpacking to take a lot longer than it did. This is the finale, everyone. The desk is in, it's in our client's office. He was kind enough to let me sit in his chair as our team makes faces through the glass. <laughs> she didn't realize she actually. <laughs> but this is one of the most grand offices I've ever been in. Obviously, you can tell our client has a hobby that he's very into and it's just so cool the way that he has set this room up to display everything and then clearly the centerpiece of everything is our desk. So to walk you guys through a little bit of the function on what we built and what went into this, on the left side we have obviously matching doors to go with the rest of everything but we've got three drawers here that all have bastone walnut fronts and dovetailed sides on them. Then we've got the pencil tray here that comes out with a matching front. And then on the right, we have our printer tray. And I guess we can thank our sponsor again now, Docking Drawer, because they supplied this awesome hardware to allow the, the outlet to plug in his printer. 
and that's got all the nice bloom, soft close hardware. Bum, bum. And then of course, the main feature on this desk is obviously the way that all three of these sides waterfall down. So you've got your two edges, your back, and I'm gonna miss this piece. Honestly, there's some pieces that we just have in the shop long enough and we spend enough time with them that you kinda like develop this connection in a weird way to an inanimate object. But I think we've all definitely formed a bond with this desk, so it's gonna be a little sad to leave. But like I mentioned in last week's video, this client might have us build some chairs for that table. So maybe we have to make another road trip out of it. Who knows? And that is going to conclude our Salt Lake City series. Again, thank you guys so much for watching all of these videos. If this is the first video from the series you're seeing, you're gonna wanna go back and watch us build the bed, the wall art, the dining table, and the two benches for this client. But if you've made it all the way to the end of the series, just a huge thank you to you guys for sticking around and your loyalty. And I don't think I've mentioned it at any time throughout this whole series, but if you guys feel that we've earned it with the work that we've put into this, please leave us a like on the video and please subscribe to our channel. It really, really helps us out. Next, we're heading off to Toronto for another delivery. So in a few weeks, we'll be seeing you guys there and thank you for watching.